Hola, buenas tardes, buena tarde a todos. Good evening. We are here again the Barcelona Bluegrass Camp team in order to organize a, a banjo workshop that we that will be introduced by Luis. A uh, recordaros a todos que somos la asociación al Festival al Ras, que organizamos el Festival al Ras cada año. Esperemos que este año ya acabe el COVID de una vez y podamos organizarlo en noviembre. Uh, presencial, con muchas ganas, más ganas que nunca, con muchas bandas y mucha gente. Uh, y recordaros también que aparte de organizar el Festival al Ras, pues también organizamos el Barcelona Bluegrass Camp, del cual está esta, estos workshops son una pequeña muestra online, pero normalmente lo que hacemos es una sesión, una, un, unas jornadas de, con profesores de, de música de Bluegrass de en todos los instrumentos, banjo, mandolina, guitarra de Bluegrass flat picking, finger picking, contrabajo, todos, fiddle, no sé qué me dijo, eh, dobro incluso alguna vez, ¿vale? Y bueno, este año no lo hemos podido hacer debido al COVID como ya os podéis imaginar, pero esperemos que el año que viene también retomarlo con más fuerza todavía y más ganas. Ah, recordaros que tenemos la, la iniciativa este del teaming.net, si os queréis afiliar, digamos, a hacer una donación de un euro, un euro mensual, ¿vale? Y que después además se puede desgrabar Hacienda, y si no, obviamente, aceptamos donaciones. Uh, we, have, we accept donations in PayPal to this, this address. And that's all that I want to say. Luis, hello. Hola. Hola, y hola, John Manel. ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo estás? Muy buena tarde, John. Good evening. Bu buenas tardes a todos. La verdad que es un placer continuar con estas actividades que estamos haciendo desde Alras. Eh, recordamos que aparte de Joan Manel y yo mismo somos muchos más, está Jorge, está Michael Laxton, está Ignasi, Xavier, eh, Juan Pablo, Jorge y como ha dicho Joan Manel vamos a organizar estas sesiones mensuales, ya os avanzaremos quién vendrá el próximo mes, de estos talleres de una hora que son totalmente gratuitos y a través de Facebook y YouTube, pero os pedimos un poco la vuestra colaboración. Yo creo que está bien que apoyemos un poco esta música que nos gusta tanto y puede ser tanto como un euro con el teaming, como cinco euros, como diez, como quince, lo, lo que queráis, lo que podáis y pensad que todo esto va a ir a los profesores y que podamos continuar con estas actividades que es, bueno, dentro de toda esta pandemia que estamos viviendo, el COVID pues un poco un soplo de aire fresco, ¿no? Y que podamos disfrutar de esta pasión que tenemos todos, que es la música bluegrass, en el instrumento que sea, banjo, guitarra, es indiferente. Yo, por ejemplo, creo que todos aprendimos mucho en el Bluegrass Camp con Chris Luquet tocando la guitarra o con Martino Copo. Al final, una cosa que me gusta mucho del Bluegrass es que es un estilo de música, hola Xavi, hola Pepe, es una música que es la misma tocada con diferentes instrumentos. Sabéis que es muy típico lo de que uno toca el banjo y toca la mandolina, porque es un lenguaje al final y todos nos gusta este lenguaje. Y sobre todo, pues pido un poco esto, ¿no? Pedimos que la colaboración también gracias a Emilio, no sé si nos estás viendo, ahí que ya Jean Manel agaza la mandolina. El próximo mes tendremos a un mandolinista. Fantástico. Fantástico. No sé si hoy, ahora lo valoraremos un poco Jean Manel y yo, si vamos a avanzar el nombre de este fantástico mandolinista. Pero bueno, déjame presentaros un poco a, a, a este fantástico banjista que se llama Hank Smith. ¡Hey, Hank! ¡Welcome! ¡Hey, Hank! Hey, uh, let me introduce you a little bit in Spanish. Hey, Nacho, ¿qué tal? Al final no hemos podido quedar en Madrid, es eh? una lástima, eh? pero bueno, no pasa nada. Eh, hey, David, hola. Mira, muy, muy, muy importante, muy importante, chicos. Eh, Han va a dar una clase de una hora, cómo ve el banjo, técnicas modernas, y bueno, y va a tocar algunas, algunas piezas. Pero creo que es muy importante que le hagáis preguntas, un poco que haya feedback. Hey, yo a actuar a... Hola, Tony. Antonio, de, desde aquí, buenas tardes. Eh, pues es muy importante eso, que hagáis preguntas, dudas, porque es un lujo tener aquí a Han. And now I'm going to talk to the, the rest of Europe. We are really welcome to, and really happy to have Han. And please, ask questions. He's going to talk techniques, you know, but it's really important the feedback, you know, because he's in North Carolina right now alone at his room. And uh, it's nice to have some, some feedback from the students. So, okay, I'm going to shut up and please welcome to Hang Smith. Blah, thank you. Plus, 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 right. applause. Yes, yes, thank you so much. Uh, gracias. And it's great to be here. Um, 
I'm going to start off with a song, and um, we're going to kind of go through some things here in the workshop that uh, I hope you'll find interesting. And like Louis said, please ask questions. Feel free to interrupt as well. You can totally do that. Um, so to kind of get things started, here's a fun arrangement of the Beatles' Day Tripper. That's a, that's a fun tune to play, um, and what's cool about it is that it lets you use a lot of familiar banjoistic sort of chord shapes and, and rolls and things like that. So it's not um, making you do anything too crazy with your hands. You can kind of keep everything more or less the same shape, which is a really cool way to approach um, the, the song. Um, you want to, to adapt whenever you're playing non banjo or rather non-bluegrass songs on banjo you want to try to make them as banjoistic as you can and with pop songs Beatles songs and stuff like that anything that has a strong voice leading vocal melody the idea is to use the chords to capture as much of that as you can um, you know you hear the vocal line in there but also the rhythm and maybe the harmonies and stuff like that so you're trying to trying to do all the things at once to try to make the song sound as much like the recorded version as you can with just a banjo. But the cool thing about a banjo is, is that you're playing melody, harmony, and rhythm all at once. So this is a very interesting way to adapt those things from bluegrass into playing a different kind of music. So with this, we won't go line by line through all the tabs and stuff like that. Those, those are there for you guys to have as a reference and to play um, you know, on your own and stuff like that. But it is worth explaining some of the stuff and we have three tabs that we're working with today. Day Tripper is the is the first one, and I thought that would be an easy one to sort of uh, segue from a bluegrass universe into something other than that. And um, basically, with this, we're keeping everything in root position. It's in the key of E. Let me slide over here. It's in the key of E. So we start with our opening riff like this to get that E7 sound, which is very bluesy. It's a blues-based thing, which is why it fits so well with um, your preconceived bluegrass notions. Um, but what's good about this arrangement is that it keeps more or less all of the different chord shapes in root position. So 
you have the first, the opening riff, which is right out of this open E chord. And then as we move into the next bit, you're still sort of in the same shape. We're not up here, though, or here. We're down here in, the, in an E7. So it's kind of, everything is still in the same general shape. When it comes up to the A, the next chord, you're, you're doing the same thing. So again, everything is still in this root position, familiar banjo shape as though you were doing the boom chuck kind of thing. Um, and then even in the bridge chorus area where it moves to the F sharp, the day tripper part, the actual part where they say it. Still, all the same shape. Back to A. But now here it's different. You can have bar chords, that's okay. But what that does is gives you the opportunity to um, add a little harmony to it. So in that, it's the and I found out part in the lyrics. Um, which isn't necessarily harmonized, but again, we're coming up with our own arrangement for this just based on what the overall song sounds like. So there's a little bit of leeway, like there's no, you know, we're not playing classical guitar where you have to, you have to do it a certain way, it has to be done this way, etc, etc. This is more like pretty freewheeling, we get to do what we want with it, which is what's fun about it. And when you're learning pop songs or non-bluegrass songs on the banjo, you can kind of forget the rules a little bit in some in some ways. Like you don't always have to forward roll. If we were playing an Earl Scruggs song, you know, where there's a strong forward roll and strong drive and that kind of stuff, you're really not going to do that here. So you can adapt what you're doing right hand, left hand wise to to get the song to make sense, to get everything to sound the way it's supposed to, the way you want. We, if you if you were to do a side by side comparison of this arrangement to the original recording of the Beatles doing it, you'll notice there's verses missing. We didn't didn't go for the full three minutes or three and a half minutes, however long the song is. We don't need to. You just need to be able to hit the the parts that are relevant and go. When we get to the middle part, same thing. We're in B now, but we're still in the same root position, and there's a big uh, big build. After we get through the, the riff, which repeats in E, A, and B in this case. Um, so we can build a B7 chord. So I'm pinching in this inversion of B7 here, root position. And then we come up here to the next one. Oops. And then bar, 7, octave. And then we're back to the top. And everything stays the same shape. So you can get a lot of, of things done, there it is, yep. You can get a lot of things done by just keeping your hands more or less in the same spot. Nothing is too terrible, like terrible finger buster, I guess, like you're not gonna get tangled up. Um, and it, it's fun, it's a lot of fun, everybody knows what it is, you know, everybody uh, is familiar with the Beatles for the most part and um, they can kind of sing along, which is also cool. Um, so that's it's kind of like I said we're gonna blast through this because we don't have a whole lot of time we only have about an hour or so to to discuss three tunes um, so I just want to make sure that everything makes sense and so this is your first chance to ask questions anybody have any questions so far and no problem if not we can always save those for the end and I'm also going to offer up um, my email address so that if you have questions after the fact happy to answer those as well Okay, if no if no further questions, then we'll keep uh, we'll keep on keeping on here and um, talk about the next tunes, which are original um, original tunes that I I've, I've been working on in the pandemic. Uh, I've been able to compose or am in the process of composing twenty four preludes in all twelve keys and relative minors. And at last count, I'm around sixteen or seventeen deep, uh, which is exciting. Um, these are short pieces only about two three minutes long um, and all of them will be eventually arranged for uh, banjo and string quartet so they can all function on their own as solo pieces to be played on the banjo but then we'll also have string arrangements to go with them as as they are written uh, so that's exciting and I included the B major prelude and the A flat major prelude both do very different things 
We'll do the A-flat major prelude next because it's more straightforward um, and uses diatonic harmony, which is to say uh, diatonic is a fancy way of saying two things that sound good next to each other. Um, and if we're in A, the key of A-flat, mm -hmm. just real quick so you can kind of get a, an idea of the, the basis for what's going on here. Um, this is A-flat major. We're going to do A-flat major 7 because that lets us use our open G string here, which is a nice, very nice sound, I think. And then if we're continuing along in A-flat diatonically, the next chord is B-flat minor, C minor, C sharp, E-flat, F minor, Ooh, too far. <laughs> uh, G F diminished, and then we're back to A flat. So it's all very nice sound. It sounds really cool, and it's and it's been a lot of fun to explore in A flat major um, on the banjo because normally we're you know we stay in G. G is home base. You can't really do that in A flat without a capo. So uh, it's nice to be able to explore the fretboard a little bit. Um, a half step north of where we normally would live. So I'm going to play the A flat prelude and then we'll, we'll kind of talk about what's going on in it. So here we go. mistakes there. Um, there's the A flat prelude and like I said it moves pretty fluidly through the diatonic scale. That was the idea in composing it. I didn't want to have anything too, uh, thank you very much, I didn't want to have anything too complex so that um, ultimately it could be played a little faster. That was a little under tempo but you get the idea and um, it's a lot of fun to play and move through those uh, chord changes. So two things inspired this piece. The first was the idea, and we'll spend a little bit of time on this because you can get a lot of mileage out of this as banjo players, uh, and that is the idea of a cascading chord inversion. So what do we mean by cascading? We mean like piano players. When you hear, say, French Impressionist music, Ravel, Debussy, uh, etc., where they hit those big, long uh, chord inversion, sweeping sort of beautiful cascading sound. Um, as banjo players, we're a little bit more limited in our range, so we have to kind of make up ground where we can. And so, if we're in the key of A flat here, and we're trying to use the top string to evoke the A flat major sound uh, in this root position, then that means we can use the, the open string as a pivot point 
or a nodal point to get to the next uh, octave up, I guess. So, um, so we're still in A flat. Oops, seven. So basically, what it means is, as you go through the uh, the chord here, whatever you do on one end, you go up to the top and do it again. So it's literally the same thing twice. But when they're combined and you use the open string as your pivot point, you can get that big and that cascading sound. And so that's going up by octave. We start here and come back down. But we're still very A flat. That's all that is. We can also go up by step. So we discussed at the beginning A flat, the next one is B minor, um, or I'm sorry, B flat minor, C minor, and so on and so forth. You can start with A flat in the in the top or the bottom rather, and then end up in the B flat minor on the top. So if you want to come back or just keep walking up the diatonic scale, it ends up being um, a lot easier to do that. Oops. And keep on trucking. Um, so we went up by an octave. step. And so you hear how even in just doing that you can kind of hear how the parts of the tune are constructed from this as if this was raw material, if this was the, the materials that we're working with here. Um, you can see that the tune is made up of that and all the chords in the song more or less until it leaves the key, which it does at one point, um, are in that diatonic range. So it's all pretty straightforward for the most part. Um, and so what we did, the other bit of inspiration that uh, created this tune is um, a heavy diet of Dmitry Shostakovich. Sometimes you hear a lot of that stuff in his writing. Also, um, Ravel and Debussy, as mentioned before, Satie, the French Impressionists. Um, if any of my friends out there in France are watching, um, bonjour. So... So as we go through the tune, we've got a little intro, and then the melody just comes straight in. And so we're, if at the intro part, we're, we're staying away from the third, staying away from the major third at first. Because that's where the melody lives, and the major third and seventh are the most powerful like that's the black hole that's pulling all of the tonality into it like you're always wanting to hear that your ear is always led towards the third and the seventh so to give the third maximum impact we start the melody on that to our next chord in the diatonic harmony the B flat minor and then we're in F minor we skipped we skipped over some Back to A flat. F minor again. F major or uh, A flat major seven again, just stretched out. Then uh, C sharp, B flat minor, and we're back to A flat. So we're not following a strict one four five sort of blues pattern where it resolves from the five to the one. We're just staying in the diatonic scale the whole time. So it's still gonna work. It's all gonna work. And then we do it again. Uh, one composition trick is if you play the melody in the low register, then you go and do it again in the high register for repetition. So you're not exactly doing the same thing over and over again, but the melody sticks in the, the mind of the listener. So you're, you've heard this once already, but you didn't hear it high up. Oh, sorry. Hard to do slow. Same chords. first break, which is going to be, which is a C sharp major. We've moved into that, into that area, major seven. C minor, starting to leave the key. Here's uh, an E flat with a D in it. 
uh, so E flat major seven. But then we bring it back. Straight up major scale. Okay, so there's the there you could call that the A part, I guess, or maybe an A B A part if you want to give it some uh, like semblance of a folk tune or a bluegrass tune before we move into C minor uh, to get that um, to get that sound. And then we move out of the key. Here is where things get um, harmonically different. We've left the diatonic scale at this point. We're now in F and F7, which is still allowed because it shares common tone with A flat. So it's not entirely foreign. We didn't move into outer space entirely. But it does leave the overall tonality of the of the thing. We're not diatonic anymore. And that the whole point of that is so that we can build into a C major, which is you start to hear that again. So let's move through this section real quick. It goes like this. same melody again in C. We just transitioned from the A flat to the C major by way of E flat, F, and G. So that's like your... And then now we're in C. Do the same melody. run here. Move up again. All diminished chords um, repeat every four frets. And then A flat. So to recap there, we went from sorry, an A flat diminished to a B diminished to an A flat again. And then we walk it down. Back to the top. This time, when we go back to the melody, if we're following, uh, you know, the form here to go back to the original theme in the original key, we are going to do the cascading chord inversion trick that we learned at the beginning. And then, and then F minor. that ending. Build. 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 Resolve. And that's it. And then we just finish it out with one of those. So as complex as the tune seems when you hear it, the basis of it is very simple, and the melody just, it's the same melody over and over and over again. Um, a good banjo buddy of mine by the name of Jens Kruger, fellow uh, European, um, taught me a bunch of stuff like that wherein you really only need a very simple thing to start with. And then you can add and add and layer and layer and layer, and if you get to the point where the layers are overshadowing what the original idea was, then strip the layers down again and, and start over. If you're uh, your um, your ideas sound in the first place. Um, oh, a question. Let's see. And well, Stock says, I would like to know your way of writing a string quartet accompaniment for the piece. Maybe you can tell us something about that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so with a tune like this, um, this would mean that the string quartet section, the string parts, would accompany the banjo rather than it be a standalone string quartet. Like I could write a string quartet on the banjo and just have the string quartet play it. But in this case, the strings would accompany the banjo, so the string parts are, are going to serve the melody that's already there. So what that means for the string players is that there's gonna be a lot of pad sounds, a lot of chords, things like that. They're gonna, they're gonna support the chord things that I'm doing in this at first. So what I always try to do with string quartet parts um, 
whether they're su the supporting role or they're the lead role, is to have them, one, weave in and out of what the banjo is doing, because there's a lot of room here for them to do that in, in terms of their tonal range, um, because cellos can get really deep and violins can get really high above the banjo, and in terms of melodically what they're doing. So if I'm doing this, by the way, the string quartet part for this one hasn't been written yet, so we can discuss ideas, it'll be great. And then I'm resting on a chord. So for me, if I'm just sitting here rolling essentially on this chord, then that means they can call, they can do the response to that. They could echo what I just did. Cool trick is just to have a, a lot of uh, call and response types with the banjo. Um, so, you know, you, you would have it sort of interplay, weave in and out of what the banjo is doing and that kind of thing. And, the, and there's room for the strings to sort of shine in that regard um, as they're going through it. There's a lot of things the strings can do that the banjo can't too, which is really cool to accent it. So, you know, you would have uh, in this case, again, they're just they're going to support what's going on um, without getting too deep in the weeds of of what the the strings would do in this particular piece because again it hasn't quite been fleshed out yet for that. Um, it's going to be just a very simple um, support of the melody and that kind of thing. Um, could the string stand alone? Sure. If I give if I give the uh, melody over to one of the the others or split it up, that's another cool trick is to. If the banjo is playing, you know, if you've got four notes, then there are four instruments in the string quartet that could take each of those lines. And if you treat the chords themselves, not as stacks of chords, but as individual melodies working together in counterpoint, then you can split those chords up among the four instruments. And so at any given point, they can split out and do main bits of the melody and or have the supporting chord things without the banjo doing anything. It could, the banjo could drop out for sections and let the strings do it. Um, um, very cool, yeah, we can definitely discuss that. Um, uh, before we get too into detail with it though, uh, there's one more question I do want to offer real quick. Bluegrass music is mostly done in 4-4 four, or 2-4, two, four, sometimes with some waltzes in 3-4, but this is in 5-4, any suggestions for beginners? What I would suggest for beginners in 5-4 um, is to find, if you think this is a tune that does it, then that's totally cool, but to find a tune that's accessible in 5-4 that is easy to count out, um, one thing you can do just to just to practice on your own is to set your metronome, uh, set your metronome for a comfortable tempo, um, but also don't set it for 4-4 four, four, or 2-4, four. you can set it, sometimes you can set metronomes to 1-4 or no time signature, it says that, where it's just a straight click and no beats are accented. Um, and just practice this. I'm just boom chucking, not doing anything special. And count out five instead of four. So like one, two, three, four, five, one. This is really easy. Again, we're just going to strip this down to the most basic thing and go from there. If you wanted to add a little swing to it, you could go, you could subdivide your five, four, one, two, three, one, two. One, two, three, one. through Bela Fleck's tune, Blue Bob. That was my first foray into 5-4. I didn't know 5-4 before that. Um, and that tune taught me what I needed to know about how to split up the rhythm. Um, and Blue Bob to me sort of sounded like a 5-4 version of uh, like Big Mon or a bluegrass tune like that. So again, with just trying to get used to something in 5-4, um, finding something accessible that makes sense to you, that you can repeat the melody and it, it doesn't feel weird or janky or jumping around, um, and then just try to split your beats up um, in groups of 3 and 2 or 2 and 3 or 4 and 1, which is a little weird sometimes because then you get like an extra thing. Sometimes uh, a good example of maybe um, a 5-4 or something that sounds like 5-4 in bluegrass would be Wheelhouse, has the extra G run at the end. Um, even though it's not a straight up 
five four because they are splitting it between a two four bar I think and a three four bar so it's not quite five four but it kind of acts like it. Um, the little extra G run in, in wheelhouse kind of throws people off, but if you think about it in terms of a five four bar instead of a two four bar and a three four bar, that might help. Um, but again, for me, it was Bela's Blue Bop that really kind of hammered home the rhythm of a 5-4 and it made it accessible. Um, so I hope that helps. We can talk more about it again uh, later. If you want to email me, I'm totally down to talk at length about this stuff. And then going back to the string quartet, um, the string quartet stuff real quick from Manuel, um, the idea is to with in, in the next tune, I'm, I'll be able to talk more about this Manuel in the next song because that's going to do something totally different than uh, than this one does um, because it's a very modern sound. So the strings have more room to play something else other than what the banjo is doing. For really simply though, um, for when arranging strings uh, for a banjo tune like this, where you want the strings to support the instrument then you would essentially go through and try to imagine, one, what is the bass doing? What is the cello doing, first of all? Is it staying on all the roots, or are they going to move harmonically some, some other way? Maybe instead of, if, if we're playing that, the cello is actually playing an E-flat in the bass. That could change the, the, the nature of it a little bit, but you, you'll want to move around, move the bass around. Um, You'll want to move the bass around quite a bit so you can see what that's going to do to the harmony overall. And then the rest of it supports the harmony. So like the banjo is going to take center stage. And one piece of advice I've received about this um, is if the banjo is the main instrument in the string quartet, make sure the banjo gets all the good parts. Don't give the, the good parts. Don't give the, the strings the stuff that you really want the banjo to do. Let them instead support what's going on in the banjo. So anyway, we can get more in depth into that kind of stuff as we go along when we hear the next piece. But another question that came through from Luis is, what about the setup of the banjo? Um, especially to play this kind of music instead of straight bluegrass. That's a good question. So I'm always chasing tone. I'm always looking for something different. Um, I like the banjo to sound warm and uh, also have the punch when you need it. Uh, what that means is it's got a nice mellow overall tone like you can hear it doesn't sound like Ralph Stanley's banjo all back by the bridge and stuff like that but if you need to if you need to dig in and play like that it can hold its own and so with this particular banjo this is a, uh, a custom Deering Maple Blossom that I had built for me in 2005. And what's different about this banjo than the, the factory Maple Blossom is that one, it has a radius fingerboard, which comes stock now but didn't at the time in 2005. Uh, the neck is also pretty thin um, because I also have a Deering Crossfire electric banjo, and at the time I was playing them both a lot. Um, they they match so the neck on the crossfire and the neck here are the same width the standard neck on the black on the maple blossom is a little thicker than this um, but i wanted them to feel the same uh, the other thing that's different of course has a wooden uh, wooden armrest there's a pickup in it which you can sort of see the jack right there kind of hidden um, and most notably it has a kruger tone ring in it which is a bronze uh bell bronze tone ring made in Switzerland that gives it um, a bigger dynamic range uh, a lot of sustain which you wouldn't normally get so that's useful for playing like crossover classical stuff because you want the banjo to be able to sustain quite a bit but uh, even banjos set up for bluegrass can do that if you manipulate it the right way so for those of you who are uh, sitting at home with your banjo we can try this little trick together and so what we'll do is uh, we are going to um, play four notes, starting on the middle string, third string. So not too exciting on their own. Out of a C chord, essentially. And so, if we just played them straight, it doesn't sound like much. But what we're going to do here is we're going to play the first note with regular attack. We're going to play the second note harder than that one. So you can do that again. The third note. 
third note quieter than the first one, and then the last note the quietest. So we have. Right? So there's already some dynamic control that you can add. Now, when we do that, before you start playing, very gently pull back on the neck of your banjo. And then as you play those four notes, release. You can also kind of keep moving it like this, and it'll move the air back and forth as it comes out of the resonator. So we'll try that trick. So I'm pulling back just a little bit. Now I know it's difficult to tell that over Zoom or over the internet, rather, uh, but hopefully you'll get results as you go undo it on your own. The next trick that you can add to that is to, as you're releasing and or moving the neck back and forth, you very gently press into the head with your anchor finger, be it your, your ring finger or your pinky. Just push in and push out. So. And you get a lot of sustain, and it breathes a lot of life into your playing. You can get a lot of life out of it. And any banjo can do that. It doesn't have to be set up like this one. Um, but it's useful to, to know how to do that when it's time to hold notes out and stuff like that. Another question... Um, and to your point, Manuel, yes, they can play the good parts too, you just need to change roles. That's right, that's exactly right, and that's what makes it cool. So like when the melodies switch, if I'm playing the low melody and they're supporting it, then when we go to the high melody, somebody else might do that. Maybe the violin does that, or, or whatever, harmony. That'd be gorgeous, actually, to hear the violin, the twin violin part doing that. Um, um, another question from Raul. Nice to be here as well. What microphone do I use when I play the banjo on stage? This is an excellent question and one that I have I have chased gear down for years to try to get something that sounds good. And um, what I'm doing live is I have the pickup installed in here, which is an aftermarket J.A. Jones pickup from the Janet Davis catalog. I've had this pickup in this banjo since 2005. I don't even know if they make them anymore. Um, I know Fishman has a version of it that's supposed to be better. I don't know. I've never tried one of those. I've just been happy with this pickup because, to me, it captures a lot of the low sounds. You get a lot of the, the deeper, kind of more um, mid-range sounds out of the banjo than you would a mic. Um, as for mics, I also blend that signal with one of these, which is a gold tone clip-on mic um, that has a quarter inch and it clips onto your brackets um, like this. I'm going to show you. It's pretty easy to use. Just like that. And I blend those two signals, they're both quarter inch cables out, I blend those two signals um, to a pedal board on the floor which is packed up. I can't show you that on the internet right now. That has a, um, a little two channel mixing console with an effects loop and an LR Bags Venue DI. Um, so it's a little stomp box about this big with a mute and a boost and some EQ stuff. I have a reverb pedal and a delay pedal and then the little mixer. And it's all run through the mixer with one signal out from the, the bags and it works like a charm. It's great. It doesn't give me any problems. There's no feedback. There's no, no issues whatsoever. And it's consistent. Um, you know, night after night. It's been great. Um, during the pandemic, that whole rig has been converted to a recording rig. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm anxious to get it back out on the road again. Um, okay, before we get too far along, uh, I want to get to the third piece in the tab uh, that we have here, and that's the B, the B major prelude, which is very modern compared to what was going on before. Um, this will be the most modern thing um, that we've heard today, uh, notwithstanding the Beatles. And what it's doing harmonically is very different. So I'm going to play it, and then we'll talk about it. So here we go. Oops. 
there folks um, so as you can hear it's a very different piece than the last one um, it's moving through some pretty modern sounds and some pattern based stuff um, which is a little different than what we would normally expect to hear on the banjo um, but still fits under your fingers pretty well um, and thank you folks um, so what's happening basically we're starting this tune in B on an F sharp and it comes back to that later. It's following sort of the sonata form where you have the theme at the beginning, we variate from it, there's a middle passage, and then we come back to the original idea um, with an ending. And so, it's, it, this tune started with this. As, as I sat to write it, it was, I just thought that sounded cool. So it's like, it's basically an F sharp with a B, an open B in it. So like an F sharp sus, but with the B as an open string. And then and we're just walking down to an E, right? There's your B. B shows up first right there. And then the second time, it gets darker. So that motive comes back later. It's introduced at the beginning because you get your you want to get your ear used to hearing that um, that little bit of strangeness. Do it again. So that that sets it up. Now we can get weird. And so once again with the idea that we're still moving the bass note down chromatically. Now we're changing. Still the same idea. And now we transition to the, the hook, if you will, or the main. And there's B, really, with a nine in it. And so I wanted to accentuate this note by putting it on beat two. Keeping it there every time I move through these chord changes. So we've got this B, we've got the um, F sharp seven. Um, wait, what happens next? Diminished. Still there. And so, uh, sorry. Still here too back to this F-sharp 7 so we can turn it back around to B. It's all about turning it around. Oops. Until we get to the end. And then we're in A. So everything's still pretty, pretty in key, but not really. We're moving out into the, into the hinterland here. But this part of the tune uh, mirrors the beginning. So we just change the key again. This is another trick again. Restate the melody in a different key um, and change a little bit about it because we're in a different place on the neck and we can use an open, open B string here. It sort of changes the character of it. 
And then most notably after this section, what it does is it moves into this pattern based thing, um, which is a very Chick Corea Bela Fleck kind of thing to do. Um, so I'm starting with the shape, essentially, which is like an E, which you may have used for fiddle tune after fiddle tune. And then we take the same shape and just invert it. So it makes a very different chord, but then, and then that's the pattern. So once we establish this pattern, then we can repeat that pattern a whole step back. So, F sharp again so it keeps resolving to F sharp in the middle of the tune even though we're in B and so that's the sort of sonic trick that's going on in this the whole time it makes you think that F sharp is the tonal center but it's not because it's still going to resolve in B later on we're just doing this as like the tune of the prelude is in B major but it spends a lot of time in F sharp um, which is another composer trick um, as long as you can resolve back to where you started from so we're back in F-sharp again after we come out of this pattern base. Oops. Which is a way to build tension. Bring it back to the original, you've heard this in the beginning. As a transition, this happened before. B. E flat, which is the third. And then we can move into that pattern again because you already heard it once. More directly. And then we're back into F sharp again. So once we're, we're in F sharp, we're kind of at the beginning. We stay that theme. through getting back to B. A flat, C sharp, F sharp, and then here's our big B thing again. But then we can just end it nicely. So we're using the suspensions and extensions and this kind of stuff to um, resolve back to B a bit so that you're not like bound to, you know, the 5-1 turnaround and there we go. Um, originally the ending to this was more boring, it was just diatonic in B major and came back to the B, which wasn't really serving the tune very well. But this bit in the middle was interesting enough to bring back one more time because that's the hook and and honestly like of all the interesting stuff that's happening in the middle this you're probably not going to hum that you know what i mean you're probably not going to you're going to remember that as well that was a cool passage but you're probably not going to be able to go whistle it later when you go leave the room you know what i mean but this part has a very sing-song quality to it so you want to make sure that comes back into the mix um and and that's sort of a, a, a take of on modern a modern sort of sound a very 20th century sound um, a lot of times when you compose classical type music on a banjo it comes out either baroque or sort of romantic period because that makes the most sense um, but being able to expand that into more modern sounds um, especially when you start messing with ideas like Bela Fleck and Chick Corea and stuff like that, especially Bela because it's he is composing on a banjo, it is banjo music, so if there's something that he does that you think could fit, it's it's going to feel natural, it's going to feel normal, as opposed to stuff like this, which is not... I have giant hands, so it's easy for me to, to stretch, but not for everybody. And that's pretty physical. But this, this whole thing... It's not a difficult thing to do once you get the the um, once you get the hang of it. Um, 
Will there be a recording and a tab book available? Yes. In a perfect world, uh, once these things are finished, I'm going to record them with a string quartet live in the studio. Um, my musical partner, Patty Kinlaw, we play together, and Hank Patty in the current um, is classically trained violinist. And she will also appear on the recording, but she will also produce the recording um, as a classical musician um, with other classical musicians. She can speak their language. Um, ideally, uh, we'll have it, um, uh, maybe we can record it by the end of the year if I can finish these things up. I don't have many more to go. Um, and yes, there will be a tab book. I, I intend to have a book of, of all the tabs and the scores for the string quartets um, so that you have everything. Um, if you were to perform these on your own, either as solo banjo pieces or with quartets or even just as quartets by, the, by themselves. Um, it'll be available digitally, of course, and then, um, you know, we'll have hard copies at some point. You know, maybe vinyl, that would be cool. That's been a thing. Much Ado is being made about NFTs. We won't talk about that right now, but for those of you who are tech-savvy, NFTs might be the way to go for something like this. But in any case, yes, I, I envision a nice big pretty vinyl album with a tab book, a download card. Should be awesome. Keep you posted. Hopefully we'll have something uh, by this time next year if we can get it all under wraps. So anyways, uh, real quick, before we run out of time, the B major prelude uh, does have a string part. Uh, once again, it accompanies the banjo, but because it's such a modern sound, the harmony is very different, and the, the strings do something very different. This has been arranged for strings, and I don't have the recording. or It's like a MIDI recording. It's a computer playing it, and I don't have it queued up. Um, but I may be able to share it later um, with you guys uh, so you can hear what it sounds like. And it definitely does some, some interesting stuff. I actually had to have help recording the, or um, coming up with the string quartet arrangement on this because it's so weird and out there for, for strings players. And, and uh, uh, admittedly, that's not my forte, but I am surrounded by very talented people who know how to speak that language and can kind of translate the ideas into music, which is good. Um, so anyways, uh, the string quartet parts on this are allowed to explore harmonic space that we aren't doing on the banjo. So it's pretty neat to hear how they move through the weirder passages and stuff. And when it gets to this, as you'd imagine, that's a very nice sound. The, the cello is doing the almost pits like a bass would in the bluegrass band. Um, and the strings are moving through it in a very, like, stereotypically kind of classical way, and it sounds really beautiful. When it gets to this, they're out there. They're doing some really crazy, like, harmonically left-field sort of things that, that sound really neat. And hopefully I can share that with you guys soon. But anyway, um, that is... That is almost it. Do you guys have any questions based on that? I know there's a lot of information. It's like a fire hose of info. Um, uh, it's it's pretty interesting to be able to present this stuff to you guys. Um, and I'm glad you've been here. Uh, so why don't we do this in the last few minutes of our presentation here. We take it out with a little something banjo-y instead of um, not so banjo-y. And uh, maybe we'll play, let's see, how about... How about this?
awesome. Thanks so much, you guys. Any last questions? It's been really cool being able to do this. I hope to meet you all in person one day. Um, that would be really cool once we're all vaccinated and can hang out again. Um, also, come to the U.S. It'd be good to see you guys here. Um, be cool. Hey, Han. Bravo. Hey. All right. Bravo. Thanks, Luis. Bravo. Hey. Yeah. You got my name. Um, You're the venue. Cool. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> Uh, let, let me let me say let me say uh, Hank that always John Manelli is with the mandolin. So thank you, nice. thank you. It's really nice um, to see John Manelli with the banjo. I'm yeah. Happy. Hey guys. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Hank, I think is great. Uh, the one hour it was really really quick. Uh, yeah. A lot of information. Um, hey Javi. Hey, hey uh, Hank. Uh, right now in the chat is ja Javier Vaquero. He's my Hola, flamenco yeah. teacher. He's my friend. Oh, cool. teacher. Hey, hey, yeah. Awesome. yeah, that's really cool. Definitely uh, fun to learn the flamenco stuff on banjo. That's really cool. Yeah, so it's uh, really nice the uh, the flamenco guy watching the banjo workshop. So it's really nice. So awesome. well, I think let me say in Spanish, hey banjistas, tenéis alguna pregunta? Vamos a acabar. La verdad que es un gustazo tener a Hank y Unos minutitos, si tenéis alguna pregunta, yo tengo muchas, pero prefiero dejaros a vosotros porque creo que es muy interesante todo lo que ha tocado. I think it's really interesting everything you played and, I, you know, I love all the preludes. I think it's a new cool. open door for the banjo because, you know, all of us, we can go to YouTube. Of course, we can learn from Errol Sprague, blah, blah, but the thing about compose your own music, I love it. I love it and can't wait for your record and the tablatures. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I think I hope uh, people from Europe all also enjoy the workshop. And so, if uh, no question, we are going to finish. Uh, thank you for all the people, Jose Mari, people from Basque Country. I think, uh, Manuel, you are okay. Germany, thank you, thank you very much. People yes, from all of these So, oh, it's, really, it's really cool. And well, because John Manel is with the banjo, and I, I don't have a banjo here in Madrid. Uh, maybe <laughs> we can finish with a. Of course, there is a delay, no problem. But maybe we can finish with a uh, shape and uh, oh, oh, did you come to me? Bam, 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 bam. So maybe <laughs> one of you, one of you guys, you can play the first one. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Go, 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 John Manel. Go, 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 John Manel. Who wants to play? Yeah, play the first one, John Manel, and then. No, you have the second one. The second one, me. Okay, so here we go. Ready? Here it comes. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. There we go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Al, and I hope and I wish to have you in live uh, physical format in Barcelona at the Bo Barcelona sure. Bluegrass Cup or in Al Ras sure. or just enjoying uh, Barcelona. So thank yeah. you very much. For sure. And we, uh, I don't know if John Manel, do you want to have uh, to say anything? Mention some, something? Well, now I will take again. <laughs> no, 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 mandolin, no, mandolin. no, because we have an announcement to, do, to make. Yeah. Yeah, uh, noticias, good news. We have uh, we have news for for the next month. Uh, we have we will have another workshop like this. But in this case, mandolinist, a uh, very good, nice mandolinist. Let me put this. Uh, one moment. Sorry. <laughs> ah, this way. Uh, this way. We will have. Chan 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 chan. The great. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, let me remove this. On Saturday, April the 17th, el 17 de abril, apuntaros, apuntaros uh, es un fantástico músico, maravilloso, y además toca la mandolina, con lo cual no se puede tener nada mejor. <ríe> vale, y además una gran persona. Uh, os lo recomiendo a todos, no solo a los mandolinistas, los banjistas también seguro que disfrutáis, ¿vale? Porque es un músico fantástico. Se puede aprender seguro muchísimo. Vale, no sé, Luis, si puedes comentar alguna cosa. No, I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much again. Thanks to John Manel because John Manel is the technical guy. Everything 
uh, right now with the streaming thing is thanks to John Manel is awesome. The errors is because of me. I did the, all the errors, but <laughs> it was me. <important>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, uh, Manuel from Germany wants to be in contact. If you want to, I think uh, Han is yeah. going to give the uh, email or something, uh, email address up to you. How do I do that? Yeah, I don't know if I. Well, all right. If you can, if can you can I share your, your. Can I share your email address, Han? Uh, yes, please. Please share yeah. my email address. Yep. Uh, at Gmail, the one at Gmail, yeah. Yep. Sorry, one moment. Here it is. Uh, Feel free to email me. I would love to stay in touch. Here it is. Yeah. There we go. That's it. Yeah. Shoot me a message. So, it's the best uh, way. Thank, yeah. Thank you very much, Han. Thank you very much. We really appreciate uh, thank you. Uh, and your energy, everything, your music. And here in Spain, we are really happy to have you. And the workshop, I think it was great. And thank you very much to the people watching the workshop. Thank you, John Manel, all the association. Yeah. And well, Keep playing banjo and see you next workshop. Thank you very much. Yep. Bye. 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 Bye.